Welcome back to the channel. This is Trinity Storm, and you are watching seventh part of What If Naruto Was Betrayed and Destroyed Konoha. If you enjoy this video, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Now, wasting no more time, let's start the story. Killing Hidan and Kakuzu wasn't nearly as difficult as Naruto anticipated when he and his allies confronted the two Akatsuki members. Nagato had proven himself to be trustworthy when he sent the Zombie Brothers, Takumo to capture Ni Yugito, but what they got was a trap with Naruto, the other eight Jinshuriki, and several squads of Kumo Anbu waiting for them. It didn't take long for Kakuzu to realize he and Hidan had been sold out and betrayed by Nagato as the Jashin priest cursed. Naruto took on the two by himself, while the others stood by as backup in case he needed it. He didn't do it. Flashback. Hold still, you fucking heretic. Jashin Sama needs your blood. Exclaimed Hidan as he attempted to slice Naruto with his weapon to obtain the blood required for his ritual to deeply wound him. Tell your Jashin Sama, he's a puny little bitch of a god want Tobi, Naruto retorted, and Hidan looked enraged. What did you say? Oh you are such a fucking dead asshole. You hear me? Dead. D-E-A-D. -E dead. Hidan yelled furiously as Naruto dodged all of his Saiya strikes and leapt away from the last one before dodging a flying kick from Kakuzu. He's not going down easily, Hidan. Even if you use the ritual, the Uzumaki clan were notorious for being able to take hits most shinobi couldn't walk away from which was one of the reasons they were feared. Keep that temper in check, Kakuzu said as he saw Hidan glaring at him and then shooting it at Naruto. Fuck you and the Uzumaki clan's abilities. They were a bunch of pathetic heretics and weak bitches anyway, Hidan retorted before being blasted by Naruto's intense wave of killer intent. Do not insult my clan again, Jashin priest, or else not even your puny god will be able to save you," Naruto said coldly, drawing his sword from its sheath in a much more animated manner than usual. Even though there was no evidence to support Naruto's theory, he suspected it had something to do with Kyubi becoming whole again. Watch it, Hidan. That blade is emitting a power that has my five hearts racing erratically, Kakuzu warned. But Hidan ignored the money-hungry missing nin formerly of Taki and charged forward, scythe in hand. I don't care what fucking sword he's holding. He's a heretic of Jashin-sama, and all heretics must die for his glory. Exclaimed Hidan, clashing with Naruto's sword and attempting to cut into the Uzumaki's flesh. Fool. Even his god is powerless against the might of that weapon in Kyubi. Kakuzu thought as he saw Hidan land a few blows, but they all hit the Jinshuriki's armor plating and shrugged them off as if they were nothing. Naruto took out his gauntlet's claws and charged them with Kyubi's now much more potent chakra before kicking Hidan away and slashing down at the Jashin priest with the claws, knowing the chakra would leave the blades to hit its intended target. Hidan screamed in agony as he stumbled around, his knees collapsing on the ground, his blood spilling onto the ground, and his organs visible within his injured body. You fucking bastard. When I get my hands on you. Screamed Hidan, but was cut short when Naruto drove the sword of Jubi through his neck and began to cut downward, cutting through bone as well as flesh to make the pain even more excruciating. Hidan could only make a pained noise that reflected his anguish while looking up at the Kyubi Jinshuriki's one cold blue eye that told the Jashin priest he had fucked with the wrong guy. Kakuzu appeared to realize this as well, as he attempted to flee, but the others sent him flying back, just in time to see Naruto take his weapon out of Hidan's hands before reintroducing it into the Saika's head. Uzumaki clan style, purge of the possessed. Exclaimed Naruto as he channeled his chakra into the sword that was now piercing Hidan's brain. Before the connection that Jashin had over the priest was broken, the man let out an inhumane scream, his already mutilated body being shocked and set aflame by Naruto's power. Naruto could almost hear the curse of the god who had empowered Hidan, 
but chose to ignore it, instead witnessing Jashin's loyal disciple finally taste death after avoiding it for so long. Oh shit! exclaimed Kakuzu as he backed away from Naruto, who had now turned his attention to him, and the Akatsuki member did the only thing he could at the time. He started pleading for his life. Begging will not save you from me, Naruto replied, knowing that if this man was left alive, he would come after him one day out of vengeance. Furthermore, there was a slim chance he could resurrect the Akatsuki and target the others for their Jinchuriki. If not now, then later in the year, or if they were chosen by other children to be the next hosts. Wait, wait. I can help you take down the Akatsuki. I have intimate knowledge of how they operate and will give it to you freely in exchange for sparing me, pleaded Kakuzu, not wanting to die at Naruto's hands or with that sword in his hand. Summoning Jutsu! exclaimed Naruto, and a massive dragon appeared in front of him. Why have you summoned me here, Uzumaki-san? Asked a large red dragon with crimson scales in a form that towered over even the tallest trees in the area. To feast on him, Draconis. He's an Akatsuki member, Naruto explained, his red dragon Draconis narrowing his eyes at Kakuzu, who had been around long enough to fear the large summons and had seen them in battle only once many years ago to know it was foolish to cross them. Yes. I've heard of the Akatsuki from Bahamut. Is this one of those fools? Draconis replied before quickly biting the screaming man in half and crunching loudly on the upper part of his body. Draconis shrugged as Naruto asked, Tasty? I've had better, Draconis replied, with Naruto nodding in agreement. No doubt, and thank you for your assistance, Naruto said, bowing slightly. It was an honor, Uzumaki-san, Draconis replied before going, poof, and returning to the summoning world. What's next? Roshi asked, looking at Naruto with a smirk on his face. Simple. We go kill the true leader of the Akatsuki right now, Naruto replied, knowing that the time had come to put down the man who had caused so much damage to the world like a rabid animal. Akatsuki headquarters sometime later. Toby realized something was wrong when he noticed the statue that would house all nine biju had vanished. Indeed, the air was thick with bloodlust, and he began to suspect that a trap had been set to keep him here in order to end his life. Toby, however, would have to be betrayed by Payne, Conan, and others, with various contingencies in place to ensure their target did not escape. Hello Toby. We meet for the second and final time, Naruto said as he emerged from the shadows, accompanied by Nagato, Konan, Itachi, and the other Jinchuriki, all ready for battle. Second time? Toby inquired, Naruto smirking. You once held me as a child with explosive tags covering my body, or don't you remember? Naruto replied, as Toby narrowed his one visible eye at him. Yes. Yes I did. Had I known you'd be such a problem in the future, I would have detonated them and destroyed both your parents' spirits in the process, Toby shot back, Naruto glaring at him. Well, that missed opportunity is going to bite you in the ass, Naruto replied before drawing his sword and watching Toby unseal a scroll to reveal his own strange fan-shaped sword. I was saving this for later, but you forced my hand, Toby said before activating his Sharingan eye. Your eye will not help you here, Naruto replied as Han let out a massive wave of steam that covered the entire room. Someone has been telling you ways to counter the Sharingan, Toby said, his voice tinged with curiosity. Yes. Someone did, Naruto replied simply before the two charged and clashed with their weapons, causing the ground to shake. Do you really believe the Uzumaki prophecy will save you from me? The prophecy is a double-edged sword that speaks of you either saving or destroying the world as we know it, and given that almost all the biju are here, I think it's pretty obvious you're going to make the latter happen. Toby said as the two clashed weapons. And you shouldn't believe everything you hear or read, Toby Teme. 
prophecies are open to interpretation and can be misinterpreted, as Konoha has already done, Naruto shot back before knocking the man back. Do you really think I can best it? I am Uchiha Madara, the most feared Uchiha of all time. Exclaimed Tobi, as Naruto scoffed. You are no Madara. Uchiha Madara does not hide in the shadows like you have. His pride would not allow him to do so no matter what. You are a want Tobi, Naruto said, and Tobi looked enraged behind his mask. Firestyle. Hell's Inferno Jutsu. Tobi exclaimed before unleashing a massive wave of fire on Naruto, who was performing his own hand signs. Uzumaki Wind Style. Chaos Winds Jutsu exclaimed Naruto before unleashing a massive wind blast that lived up to its name. The two jutsus clashed in the same way that their users did, knocking them back before Naruto and Tobi attacked each other with their swords. During their fight, Naruto was forced to admit that this fake Madara was good, and Kayubi himself revealed that this Sharingan was used by Madara himself. While this guy was most emphatically not Madara, he was a good impersonator with skills that would make the real one jealous. Toby was surprised that his Sharingan was not working on the Kayubi Jinchuriki, and a drop of water hit the back of his neck. It made him tense at first, wondering how a drop of water from the cave ceiling could have fallen on him, but he soon realized it wasn't water droplets from the cave ceiling at all. It was sweat, rather, that had accumulated and formed a drop that dangled from a strand of hair on his head was this. Panic? Was he actually afraid of someone? Impossible. They kept slashing and hacking at each other. Toba's sword and the Uzumaki's sword both cut into Naruto several times, and their injuries meant nothing to them. The battle became more intense with each violent clash of swords and jutsus in the other's arsenal. You are a strong boy, even stronger than your father, Toby replied, Naruto smirking despite everything. You appear surprised, Naruto retorted. Considering how the people in Konoha purposefully stunted your growth, I was expecting you to be well. Weak. Toby replied, Naruto grinning for Elite. You should learn to expect the unexpected, Toby. Uchiha Madara would have done that, Naruto said seeing Toby become agitated behind his mask. Toby yelled angrily at Naruto, I am Uchiha Madara. You may have the eyes of a Uchiha, but you are not of their blood. Naruto countered, pushing Toby back and hurling a kanai at the man. Fool. A straightforward kanai kano a. Thought Toby as the kanai let out a blinding flash of light, shielding his eyes from harm. And that proved to be his undoing when everyone heard and felt the sound of metal piecing flesh, and Toby looked to see Naruto's sword sticking into his chest, where the heart is located within the human body. Are you surprised? The Sharingan is all about perception. It zooms in on things thrown on things to tell the brain where it's going, how fast it's going, and when to move. The kanai I threw at you had seals on it to go off within a span of one second after being thrown and to go off in a blinding flash of light. On a normal person, it's minor annoyance that makes them flinch, but... Make a U-shaped letter that meant Uzumaki to those around him. Toby, on the other hand, was not about to go down without a fight, and during Naruto's letter-carving process, the Uchiha attempted to smite the Uzumaki with his sword. Han surprised everyone by moving quickly from his position and swung his massive sword down on Toba's sword arm, cutting it off at the elbow. Toby stared in horror at the other Jinchuriki as he saw Han, now stained in his blood, glaring at him, and cursed the man's interference. You. Bastard. Yelled Toby, though whether he was addressing Han or Naruto was unclear. It was most likely aimed at both coming from you Toby. We'll take that as a compliment, Naruto replied before pulling the sword of Jubi out of the man's body and then removing the fake Madara's head clean off its body to ensure the man died. 
Should we find out who is behind the mask? Han asked as he picked up Toba's head and handed it to Naruto. I doubt it's anyone we'd recognize. The man was a nobody, and the fact he chose the name Uchiha Madara is just more proof of that. Still. It seems wrong not to see the face of the one who planned events that destroyed so many lives, Naruto replied before ripping the spiral mask off and staring at Toba's face. The man did resemble Uchiha Madara. According to what Kayubi showed Naruto of his memories of first meeting the Uchiha before the bastard used his Sharingan eyes on the fox. The hair was black, but it was graying slightly, and the man's Sharingan eye was only active in one eye socket. Naruto frowned as he considered how that could be the case, knowing from his experience with Kakashi that an implanted Sharingan eye needed to be covered to prevent chakra exhaustion and, eventually, death. So, how did Tobi manage to do things backwards? When Naruto examined the head more closely, he noticed a seal over the normal eye that connected to where the Sharingan eye was still active. The Uzumaki studied the seal with calculating eyes, making a noise that indicated he found it interesting and impressive. What did you find, Naruto-sama? Roshi asked, as everyone came over to see what he was seeing, including the seal on Toba's head. Toby had Sharingan eye implanted into his head, just like Hitaki Kakashi, but unlike Kakashi, Toby was able to keep the eye active for a long time without too much chakra being drained after such exposure, and didn't suffer chakra exhaustion. Toby made this little seal around his normal eye to fool his Sharingan eye and his own body into allowing this optical eyesore to work while not causing a strain. It will never be used again. Toba's face shriveled up and collapsed onto itself as the group threw the head to the ground. Toba's once active Sharingan eye was apparently the only thing keeping him alive, and now that it had been destroyed. So had any form of life still connected with it? Good riddance, Yugito said, while Naruto nodded. Indeed, we only have one more problem to solve before we can have lasting peace, Naruto said as the others nodded. Konoha? Gara inquired, and Naruto nodded. Konoha. And not just the village itself. We're going to make sure that what we do is completely legal so that no one can complain when the leaf village burns to ground into ashes around us. For far too long, Konoha, its cage, Sanin, Shinobi, and the very daimyo of Fire Country have ruled with arrogance. They no longer care if they are right or wrong about anything. They believe there is no force in this kami-created world. Not to question you, Naruto-kun, but how exactly are we going to make it legal to destroy Konoha? Fu inquired. Simple. We're going after the fire daimyo, Naruto replied, as everyone looked at him as if he were insane. The fire daimyo? Whoa bro. That's a little steep, and his forces make me think we're stepping into something too deep, B responded, Naruto laughing. I understand where you're coming from, B, and I can't believe I understand you when you're talking like that. Still, I have a plan to make it work, but for that plan to work, I need all of you, and our forces to work together. I know the fire daimyo has a massive army and hides behind his massive walls. What daimyo doesn't? I also know the man is no doubt getting paranoid given the number of corrupt daimyos. What do you expect, Naruto-san? Itachi asked, raising an eyebrow. I expect complete victory, Itachi. One in which the fire daimyo has no choice but to surrender his country, along with Konoha, to us, and on whatever terms we want to set for it to be without reproach, Naruto replied, looking at the Uchiha. After Orochimaru's bases have been destroyed, we must attack the fire daimyo, Conan replied, with Naruto nodding. My agent close to Orochimaru has already marked down every single base and everyone in each one we can turn to our side, Naruto explained, with the others nodding in agreement. It was finally time to put an end to things, with Konoha standing in their way of peace and order. Konoha a little later. 
Good day, Tsunade. You're as lovely as I've ever seen you. I appreciate you agreeing to let me return to the village. It's great to be back in Konoha after all this time, said the snake Sanin Orochimaru, smiling as he looked at Tsunade, Jiraiya, and the small squad that served as the female Hokage's bodyguards. Spare me your arrogance, Orochimaru. Tsunade shot back, we both know you're in the same boat as us when it comes to the Shogun of Shadows and Naruto. As usual, you get right to the point. Tsunade, you are correct. Uzumaki Naruto has put me in a bad situation right now. Though I suspect it was more your fault than mine that irritated him. I have yet to incur the wrath of the Shogun of Shadows because I have yet to meet him, Orochimaru replied, Tsunade and Jiraiya scowling at him. That may be true, Orochimaru, but who do you think will be the brats or the Shogun's next target if Konoha is destroyed? Jiraiya inquired, Orochimaru frowning. Unfortunately, Jiraiya, you have a point. Whether the leaf is standing or not, I will become their adversary. At least with both of us siding together, we have a much better chance of defeating either opposition, Orochimaru replied, while Tsunade reluctantly nodded to her teammate, knowing that their combined might would make the enemy think twice about engaging in a costly battle. Orochimaru-sama exclaimed a battered, bloodied, and panicked Kabuto as he ran up to the surprised snake Sanin and kneeled at his feet. What exactly is it, Kabuto? What occurred? Asked Orochimaru, seeing the terrified expression on his right hand's face. This is the Sound Village. The Shogun of Shadows has destroyed Sound Village, Orochimaru-sama, Kabuto replied, with Orochimaru looking surprised and angry, while everyone behind him looked the opposite. As a result, he destroyed one base. There is nothing to be concerned about. Orochimaru said angrily to his personal medic Nin, who was trembling like wet behind the ear genin. It wasn't just the base in Orochimaru-sama. It's all of the bases in rice country. I barely escaped his forces as they ripped through the one I was in and proceeded to several others that he had already destroyed. Exclaimed Kabuto, seeing Orochimaru's fear as all his bases had prime candidates for bodies needed to switch after three years with the body he occupied. That isn't possible. How did he know where they were? Asked Orochimaru, while Jiraiya laughed behind him and glared angrily at the toad Sanin. Looks like you underestimated the Shogun well it looks like you need us more than ever Orochimaru, Jiraiya said, making the pale-skinned snake like man even angrier. Stop talking, Jiraiya. You are completely useless to this village without your precious toads. Orochimaru yelled angrily, Jiraiya scowling at him. Are you doing any better? We both know you've lost the snakes. I can see the burn mark where the tattoo was, Jiraiya countered, while Orochimaru simply narrowed his eyes at him. Perhaps, but I have a variety of skills that don't require me to use them for everything. Unlike you and those four-legged creatures, I have other skills far superior to yours, Orochimaru boasted with a smile on his face. If by other skills, you mean touching little boys in their private areas, then yes, Orochimaru, you are far superior in that area, Jiraiya replied with a smirk, as Orochimaru glared at him. When this is over, I'm going to rip out your throat. Orochimaru yelled angrily. Enough. Save your squabbling for another occasion. We need to devise a strategy to combat Naruto and the Shogun of Shadows, Tsunade said, glaring at her two former teammates. My assistant, Tsunade, requires medical assistance. Maybe yours could help him recover faster? Inquired Orochimaru, as the woman nodded and motioned for some of her anbu to transport the man to the hospital for guarded treatment of his injuries. When the dragged man was out of sight, no one noticed him smirking. Everything is going as planned, Kabuto thought to himself. 
Now that that's taken care of, we need. Tsunade began, but was cut off by a war cry from above, as one Midarashi Anko descended on her former teacher, intent on killing him slowly and painfully, and enjoying every second of it. Die, bastard! Yelled Anko, releasing her rage, hatred, and loathing for this man with every missed strike. Is that any way to greet your old sensei after all this time, Anko-chan? Nearly four years without seeing me since our last encounter and you still can't land a single hit on my body, mocked Orochimaru, only to irritate Anko even more. Stand still and die now. Yelled Anko, doing everything in her power to destroy him, and summoning her snakes to wrap around him. And it worked. Anko. Take a seat right now. Commanded Tsunade, but the special Junin didn't even bother to listen, instead staring right into the Sanin's eyes. Fill the bastard with poison. Anko commanded her snakes, and they were about to obey when Tsunade intervened, grabbing each of their heads at the base. When I tell you to stand down, Anko, I expect you to do so. Tsunade exclaimed as Anko was restrained by several Junin. How can you save him, let alone let him live? After all he's been through? He deserves to die, and you're not going to take advantage of this once in a lifetime opportunity. Tsunade narrowed her eyes at him as Anko shot back angrily. Orochimaru is far more useful to us alive than he is dead. We need him to help us fight the Kayubi Jinchuriki and the Shogun of Shadows, Tsunade replied, spitting at the Hokage's feet. As if this village is deserving of survival. You drove the Gaki from Konoha. He's coming here to kill everyone because of you and that pervert over there. Perhaps if this village didn't treat him like garbage, you wouldn't have this problem, Anko countered, and the Hokage became enraged at that remark. Get her away from me and demote her to Chunin. Tsunade commanded, she's unworthy of being a special Junin, as the snakes retreated into Anko's trench coat and the woman was dragged away. You are no longer alive, Orochimaru. Do you hear me, you Cretan? You're no longer alive. You just don't realize it yet. Anko exclaimed loudly for all to hear. Anko Chan is a lovely young lady. I can only imagine the brave soul who would marry her, Orochimaru said, as if he hadn't heard her threats. Orochimaru, save it. We must go speak with Nara Shikaku and the others in order to plan a defensive strategy against our common enemies before they strike first. Tsunade replied, and her former teammates followed her. Anko's Residence Anko was having a major tantrum in her home, breaking things, destroying things, and causing all sorts of havoc. She had that one, possibly the only chance in a hundred years to kill Orochimaru, and that dumb Senju bitch for a Hokage blew it for her. Not only that, but she was demoted to a lower rank, and now had to obey the commands of the other shinobi who outranked her, and many of them had. I don't mind if I'm executed for treason. It's more than enough for me to see the bitch and the bastard perish before I meet my end on the execution block. Exclaimed Anko before sensing another person in the room and turning to fight that adversary until she discovered who it was. It was the Shadow Shogun. I understand your dissatisfaction with the Gondam Hokage. Not everyone has the opportunity to seek justice for wrongs done to them said the Shogun of Shadows, as he noticed Anko looking at him with caution, expecting him to strike her down. What do you know about injustice? How did you get into Konoha without being discovered? Inquired Anko, with the Shogun chuckling. I know a lot more than you think, Midarashi Anko. How did I get into the Leaf Village? On in. Intimate level, I know her inner workings inside and out. There is no passage, secret tunnel, or entrance to this village holds that I am unaware of, replied the Shogun, and Anko narrowed her eyes at him. What brings you here? Anko inquired, keeping her guard up. 
Of course, to see you. Konoha's days are numbered, you know. You know this village is going to burn. Few will survive only through my good graces and those I deem worthy of a life outside its walls, replied the Shogun, catching Anko off guard. Am I one of them? Former apprentice of Orochimaru? Anko asked, surprised, as the Shogun chuckled again. Does that surprise you? I know your history with the Sanin, and I know how much you despise him. I also saw how Tsunade denied you the vengeance you craved. It must have hurt a lot to be denied what you wanted most at the time, said the Shogun, and Anko was on the verge of crying despite her best efforts. Orochimaru is deserving of death. The Hokage had no right to deny me my vengeance, and she knows it deep down. Anko exclaimed, and the Shogun nodded. I concur. Join me, and I'll assist you in exacting your revenge. Not just on Orochimaru, but on Tsunade, Jiraiya, and the entire village that despises you, replied the Shogun, widening Anko's eyes in surprise. I understand the desire for vengeance against Orochimaru and Tsunade, but... Why would I seek vengeance against Jiraiya of the Sanin? Asked Anko, who was considering vengeance against two of the previously mentioned targets. Jiraiya has a method of removing the curse seal that Orochimaru gave you from your body, the Shogun responded, Anko's eyes widening. What? Why didn't Tsunade have him take it off? Asked Anko, desperate to be free of this damn seal. Simple. To keep you under control. People would continue to hate and despise you Anko-san as long as you wore the curse seal. Yamanaka Inoichi created a comprehensive psychological profile of you and updated it over time. I myself read the most recent report. It indicates that you have a stubborn streak and a strong desire to prove yourself in front of others. That with proper grooming, you would endure all of their hatred just to prove how wrong they are, and use the possibility of having the curse seal removed one day if you stay in the village as the key to it all. Tsunade has no doubt told you how she was attacking it with her own medical expertise because curse seals are transferred through Orochimaru's mouth, while Jiraiya looks to remove it using his own seal knowledge. Isn't it the hope and promise of removing it from you that has kept you loyal, Anko? Said the Shogun, while Anko nodded because it was the only reason she stayed in Konoha. Yes. I still don't understand why they would deny me my desire. If they took it away. Anko said, not even finishing his sentence. You'd have their undying loyalty. While that may be true in terms of serving the Hokage, the village itself would not be pleased, and they no doubt feared you would leave Konoha with no real reason to stay. With all the dirty little secrets you know, the higher-ups were no doubt terrified that you would sell them out to another village, thus fulfilling their worst nightmare. The curse seal was not only Orochimaru's, but also Konoha's method of controlling you, and we both know they won't throw anything away unless the value of that something or someone is absolutely zero. While Anko hated to admit it, the truth was in his words, said the Shogun. So I join you and exact my vengeance, right? Anko inquired, the Shogun nodding. Without a doubt and without any strings attached, the Shogun replied, observing Anko's thoughtfulness. And you can remove this curse seal from me? Anko inquired, as that was the only thing equal to her desire to kill Orochimaru. As a sign of good faith, I can do that right now. We both know Orochimaru would use it to disable you if given the chance when facing him, replied the Shogun, noticing Anko's surprise. You are the seal master. Anko exclaimed, and the Shogun nodded. Yes. I've spent far more time studying the curse seal than Jiraiya. I devised a method to remove it in a fraction of the time he did. To be honest, the Sandame ordered Jiraiya to drag his feet on the matter, and Tsunade basically carried on the order when she assumed the mantle of Hokage, explained the Shogun, 
who could see Anko was upset that she had been betrayed that far back. How did you find out all of this? As this wasn't common knowledge, Anko asked, and she saw the Shogun remove a small black book with the leaf's symbol in crimson in the dead center of the cover. Here are Konoha's dirtiest secrets. Everything in here dates back to the reign of the Shodiami Hokage and continues to the present day. It took me a while to find this due to the heavy security surrounding it for obvious reasons. All of the village's dirty dealings, backstabbings, and who they killed to get their way and increase Konoha's influence. Not to mention all the secret experiments and so on that, if the general public ever found out, would easily result in Konoha's annihilation without my direct involvement. Even the fire daimyo is not immune to the events written in here, as he is mentioned in several dealings by the Sandame himself on several occasions during his reign as Hokage both before entering retirement, during his retirement, and long after coming out of retirement, Naruto explained before pocketing the book back within his robes. And Tsunade continued where he left off, Anko concludes, nodding to the Shogun. It's not surprising. After all, she was the Sandame Hokage's student, said the Shogun, as Anko stared at him with fierce determination. Remove the curse seal from me, and I'll do whatever you want. Under your command, I'll be anything you want me to be. And by anything, I mean anything. Anko exclaimed passionately, and the Shogun paused for a moment to consider her offer. Get a chair and take a seat. It will only take a few moments to remove the curse seal, replied the Shogun, and Anko quickly found a nearby chair before sitting down just five feet from him. Hours later, Hyuga clan compound. Hyuga Hinata was sitting in her room. Her father had ordered his daughter to stay until further notice because she had spoken up for Naruto during a meeting with the Hyuga elders. They had gone on and on about how they couldn't marry her off to a noble or the son of a daimyo for political power because all of their potential targets had died. While the Shogun of Shadows was responsible for the deaths of these political power brokers, it was no secret that Konoha as a whole blamed the Shogun's actions on Naruto himself, and the Hyuga clan was among the most vocal about their dislike for the Uzumaki Jinchuriki. Hanada had also been vocal, but against the Hyuga clan in general, claiming that Naruto was not the monster they had claimed he was since his birth. The Hyuga elders were enraged that she spoke out in Naruto's defense, and even more so that she did so against them while her father was present. Hanada could sense in her bones that they were seriously considering branding her with the cage bird seal and making Hanabi the heir to the Hyuga clan. The only reason they waited until now was because of the training she received to track down and disable Naruto with her team. She couldn't even talk to Neji any longer. He didn't want to talk to her because he didn't want to, but because Hanada's father insisted, and members of the clan were under orders to keep the woman away from him. Her cousin had been scarred, beaten, defeated, and humbled, and his belief in the clan's absolute power had been completely shattered beyond repair. Hanada was well aware that Naruto had played a role in Neji's transformation. Perhaps even more than she had realized at first, given Tenten's death. If it was true, did Hanada hate Naruto for it? No. How could she have? Her family didn't care for Neji as much as they did for her because he was a member of the Hyuga branch family, and a crippled one at that. Because one of Neji's eyes was useless and doctors said the man wouldn't live past the end of the month without further medical treatment to combat the burns on his body to prevent infections, her cousin wasn't even half a Hyuga in the eyes of the clan. Father is an idiot. He provokes Naruto-kun without even realizing it. He just wanted to be left alone, but no one would listen and labeled him a threat due to the Kyubi inside his body. Now Naruto-kun has gathered powerful allies and seeks to destroy the village with their help, Hanada thought, torn between wanting to be with Naruto and staying in the village to fulfill her sworn duty. Do you like Uzumaki Naruto? A figure in the shadows asked, causing Hanada to spin around and activate her Byakugan. Identify yourself. 
exclaimed Hanada as she searched for her unidentified foe. I'll ask you again, do you like Uzumaki Naruto? Said the figure as he emerged from the shadows. It's you. Exclaimed Hanada, who had been told everything she needed to know about the Shogun of Shadows and how to recognize him. Indeed. Please answer my question, replied the Shogun of Shadows, noting Hanada's uncertainty because she wasn't sure if telling the stranger was the right thing to do. Why yes. Yes I do, Hanada replied cautiously, her eyes refusing to see past the mask and hat. I thought so. He'd suspected it for a while, but was skeptical given his history with Konoha. He's had a lot of damage done to his heart, but has found those with the power to heal it. Would you leave this village behind to be with him and heal his scarred heart? Said the Shogun as Hanada looked at him with steady eyes. When you say he's found those with the power to heal his heart, do you mean? Hanada asked, almost fearful of the Shogun's response. Healed as in female lovers? Yes. He has quite a few. As a member of a dying clan, he is under the CRA, and can have multiple wives, all of whom loved him for him and not his clan, just as you have loved him for him and do not care about the Kyubi sealed inside his body, explained the Shogun. And if I join you? Can I be with him? Hanada inquired, seeing the Shogun nod. Yes, it is possible. He wants to get to know you first, of course, before any wedding bells ring, said the Shogun, who noticed Hanada blushing when he mentioned wedding bells. Naruto-kun and I. Wed? Hanada had dreamed of that day many times as a child, but had long feared it was impossible due to her shyness, Konoha's general disapproval of such a thing, and, of course, Naruto's rejection. Focus, my dear. The question you must ask yourself is whether you wish to abandon the Hyuga clan and Konoha for him. Can you do that? Asked the Shogun, who noticed Hanada close her eyes for a long moment before opening them again. Yes, yes, I will. Hanada replied, sensing the Shogun's smile behind his mask. Good. Things are in motion to have you and several others in the village relocated from here. Be ready to leave by the end of the week, Hanada, replied the Shogun before backing up into the shadows and out of sight. I'll be ready, Hanada said to herself. Yugo's residence. The Anbu captain sighed as she removed her Nako mask and looked in the mirror with depressed eyes for the thousandth time in the last four years. Hayate had only felt guilty about a few things in his life. One was being unable to save her deceased lover before the Chunin exam finals. Second, she had a child from a previous relationship with him before his death. Third, she was unable to carry out her oath to protect Uzumaki Naruto from Konoha's treachery. Yugo, like everyone else, despised Naruto for possessing Kayubi and wanted nothing to do with him at first. She only shielded the boy because Hayate was on the same security detail as Itachi. When she told Hayate about these things, he became angry with her, slapped her in the face, and told Yugo that if she didn't see past how others perceived him, their relationship was over. In some ways, she'd have to choose between her love for Hayate and her hatred for Kayubi, which was sealed inside Naruto. Yugo had decided to watch the boy in secret and decide whether he deserved any kind of malice at all, drawing on her Anbu training in being perceptive of all things shadowy. It wasn't difficult to see how her hatred for the fox was completely irrational, as she saw the boy put up with so much and yet he didn't lash out like a demonic being would in his situation. There will be no snarling, no slashing claws, no sharp fox-like teeth appearing to bite someone's face off and certainly no tales of any number appearing to swing with the power to destroy mountains. He was just a young boy. An innocent boy who was coerced into becoming the overall prison, jail cell, guard, and warden of a giant nine-tailed demonic fox that nearly destroyed Konoha. With that in mind, Yugo made the decision to defend Naruto from abusers even if it wasn't her shift, 
in order to earn Hayate's love. She wanted him to see that her love for him was stronger than the hatred for the fox that had been ingrained in the unfortunate boy. But everything changed four years ago. Hayate had died. Naruto had vanished, was declared a missing nin, and was regarded as a threat to Konoha, with a massive bounty on his head that threatened to bankrupt the village if it rose any higher. Yugao despised Tsunade for betraying Naruto, as the Senju had made no secret of her dislike for him, and Jiraiya in particular, despite his own knowledge of seal mastery. The Toad Sanin knew the boy wasn't a monster, but he chose to hate him for the fox because the Biju killed his prized student, and he wanted to exact righteous justice on Naruto for the Yandaimi's death. The man was as stupid as a pervert in his hatred of Naruto. What I wouldn't give to go back in time and do things differently since that day. I would have gotten closer to Hayate sooner, stolen Naruto away from the village, and protected him from Konoha's abusive hypocritical hierarchy, Yugo thought to herself before looking in the mirror and seeing herself mocking her. Remember when you had your chance? He was ten years old at the time. You had a window of opportunity to inform Hayate, gather your belongings, and flee with Naruto in your arms. Why didn't you do it? Because he was already too conditioned to staying in Konoha, he would never have believed what Ayer Hayate told him about Konoha, and Naruto would have gone to the third, and things would have spiraled out of control, Yugo replied to her mirror self. I can't argue with you on that. Still, would it be so bad to try? and to get Naruto to question things earlier so that when the truth came out, he would act. You are right, Kami, you are so right. I should have tried. If Naruto were here, I would apologize to him, Yugo said before hearing movement behind her. I'll make sure to pass along the message, the scrambled voice behind her said. Shogun of Shadows, Yugo said quietly, checking where she had placed her katana. There is no need for violence, Yugo. I'm not here to kill you, the Shogun replied, noticing her skepticism. Considering what happened with an Hyuga Neji and his teammate. You'll have to excuse my skepticism, Yugo countered, and the Shogun chuckled. I did that to teach Konoha in general a lesson in humility and to show Hyuga Neji the truth about how this village operates, the Shogun said, seeing the woman narrow her eyes at him. Be careful what you say about Hayate, or I'll make sure those words are your last. Yugo yelled angrily. I will not speak ill of him. You do not need to be angry. What I was referring to was Tsunade's decision not to return to Konoha and be a proper godparent to Uzumaki Naruto. We both know that if she had returned to carry out her sworn duty, Tsunade would have worked partially at the hospital, and Hayate's coughing problem could have most likely been cured. We both know Tsunade's medical. What exactly do you want from me? Yugo asked, fighting back tears that threatened to form around her eyes. Konoha's time is limited. My forces are already on the move, and the village will be destroyed, with all of its hypocritical fools being burned to death in their own homes. However, I am not so heartless as to abandon those deserving of my mercy and burn those who deserve it. I'm offering you the chance to join me and leave Konoha by the end of the week without fear of being tracked down. Do you want to take it? Will you seize this golden opportunity? Will you hesitate and remain on the sinking ship teeming with disease-ridden rats? Replied the Shogun, who could see Yugo weighing her options. On the one hand, Yugo had been raised in Konoha, trained to be one of the village's most skilled and reliable shinobi. She had done things without question. She had never ever wavered when orders were given one by those higher in rank unless it came to Naruto's protection detail growing up. On the other hand, Konoha was corrupt, a friend to no one, and missed by no one outside of its own walls. Now was her chance to demonstrate it to Hayate's spirit. I'll take care of it. You have my loyalty and support, Shogun-sama, Yugo replied, with the Shogun nodding once. 
That's helpful to know. When it's time to leave, bring what you need. It is up to you whether you want to be a part of the force that brings Konoha down. Let me know ahead of time, the Shogun said as he stepped back to leave. Wait, wait. Um. Could you? Could you tell Naruto-san that I'm? That I'm sorry the next time you see him? I'm sorry for not doing more to help him, Yugo inquired, noticing the Shogun of Shadows pause in his movements. I'll make sure to pass the message along to him, the Shogun said before leaving. Sometime later Fire Country Capital. The Fire Daimyo was getting nervous. Very nervous. Increasingly nervous. According to one of his samurai, several key outposts around the Fire Capital had gone silent, and the head of his elite guard was suggesting a possible evacuation for him and his family just to be on the safe side. The fire daimyo had dismissed the idea at first simply because the idea of the capital being invaded was simply impossible and would take a number beyond calculation. With the sudden loss of several key positions around the capital, the prospect of him leaving seemed more appealing. This shogun is bold indeed if he thinks my forces will simply kneel to him if I'm gone or he takes the capital from me. Shogun indeed. There is no royal bloodline of any country capable of being one and this one is no doubt a peasant trying to make a name for himself like all the warlords of the past, the fire daimyo thought while fanning his face and looking outside from the nearby balcony. The fire daimyo's samurai moved to engage them, but the ones they were fighting first were Jinchuriki, and they had weapons on hand that did a lot of damage. The Shogun of Shadows himself led them in his now famous robed attire, with Uzumaki Naruto standing beside him, and the two were fighting in perfect sync against all the samurai that attacked them. The two were attacked the most because one was the leader and the other was considered the second in command of the entire operation. It's a shame Gara couldn't join us, Fu said as she stabbed one samurai and broke another's face with a vicious spin kick. He's preparing Suna's forces and protecting our flank in case Iwa pulls a surprise double cross, Yugito explained before turning to face Han, who was fighting nearby. Do not feel as if you have offended my Oroshi's feelings, ni Yugito. We both completely understand because Iwa's previous actions make that a distinct possibility. Our loyalty to the one true lord and master, Han said, swinging his might dabalero and blasting others with a large amount of intensely heated steam that scalded or blinded those it hit. Naruto-sama. Go to the Fire Daimyo. These samurai, Leaf Shinobi, and Fire Temple warrior monks will surrender if he's in a hostage-taken position, Itachi said, knowing that the only way for their enemy to stop fighting was if they took the one commanding them. I've got it. Yugito. Come with me to keep an eye on my back. Said Naruto, with Yugito nodding and moving quickly to offer assistance. Watch out, kitty. Don't get frisky with the fox until later or the rakage will throw you into a time-out box, Killer B said, hearing Yugito hiss at him, as that had been a running joke at the expense of the Nibi vessel since she was spending more time with Naruto when he visited. After a brief talk with the rakage, i.e. them fighting with Naruto coming out the winter, they began dating. Within the months that followed, Naruto had asked her if she would be his wife to revive the Uzumaki clan. One of several, of course, but Yugito knew this way in advance due to meeting several others, and accepted all the same. Though Naruto could see the desire in Nibi Jinchuriki's eyes to receive her fair share of attention from him, she would not waste a single second of her time on the other wives of the family. Jerk. I'll get that rapping moron back for that. Maybe I should steal his favorite glasses and hold them hostage until he grovels? Maybe I can even get him to stop rapping? Oh yeah. Revenge will be mine and it will be sweet. Yugito thought as she plotted her revenge on Killer B. The two Jinchuriki quickly made their way into the fire Daimyo's castle via Yugito slamming her inferno hammer with Nibi's chakra enhancing the power behind it. 
The hole she made would be more than enough and would probably be considered overkill by many, but Naruto didn't care because it was all or nothing at this moment when getting to the fire daimyo and Naruto wouldn't be in Uzumaki if overkill wasn't on his. In any case, they soon found themselves fighting and smashing their way into the throne room of the fire daimyo's home, which was actually a good thing because the room was massive and gave them plenty of space to maneuver when fighting since the hallways were too narrow for their liking. Naruto assumed the leaf shinobi were all outside fighting the shinobi there. How many do you think there are? Yugito inquired, sending a large group of them flying into a nearby wall, while Naruto dispatched nearly as many with a single swing of the sword of Jubi. A lot. Could you please buy me some time? Asked Naruto as he gutted one of his foes with his gauntlet claws and kicked him into another group. Yeah but not by much. Yugito replied before swinging her inferno hammer down onto the ground and violently shaking it. Don't be concerned. I'm going to make it count. Exclaimed Naruto as he charged through several fire temple monks and into the fire daimyo's bedroom, where he suspected the man was hiding. Definitely under the bed and shaking like a leaf. He must be stopped. He's on his way to the fire daimyo chambers. Said one samurai before being struck by Yugito's inferno hammer. Pay attention to me, you moron. You're only going to get to him over my dead body and precious inferno hammer. Exclaimed Yugito, making sure to position herself so that the only way they could pursue the Uzumaki was to fight her. She wasn't about to make things easy for them. As for Naruto, he entered the fire daimyo's bedroom, a place filled with all kinds of riches that should be melted down into currency and used to finance a means to help the poor get back on their feet. All around him, Naruto saw gold, gems, and jewels of all shapes and sizes that could be better spent elsewhere than being a simple decoration for the daimyo's wife before she gets bored enough to throw them away. Hearing some whimpering near the bed, Naruto moved towards it, and heard sounds of fear coming from under the bed. Using his incredible strength, the Uzumaki threw the bed out the window, and came face to face with the fire daimyo himself. It burned the Jinchuriki's nose to have to smell such a foul thing from the scared man, and quickly picked the frightened feudal lord up off the floor. Please don't murder me. I'll give you anything you want exclaimed the fire daimyo, as Naruto smiled at him. Oh, you'll give me what I want whether I kill you or not. How quickly you give it will determine the value of your life when this is over, Naruto replied as he dragged the fire daimyo out of his room and into his throne room, where Yugito was still fighting. Pause fighting. Stop fighting each other. Commanded the fire daimyo, and his forces were stunned to see him with the sword of Jubi to the feudal lord's throat in Naruto's presence. That was quick, Yugito remarked, and Naruto smirked at her. I told you the time allotted would be enough, Naruto countered, frowning at the fire daimyo and pressing his sword closer to the man's throat. Stop fighting, everyone. Tell our forces to stop fighting as well. This conflict is over. We've been defeated. Commanded the fire daimyo, and several samurai immediately left to carry out the order. Good. Now, one of you samurai can bring in a table and chairs for everyone on my side to sit. Your daimyo has a few terms to discuss with the shogun for the unconditional surrender of everything in this land, Naruto said, a smirk spreading across his face. Everything? With fear in his voice, the fire daimyo inquired. Yes. Everything. After all, a shogun cannot truly be a shogun unless he has all the feudal lords brought to heel at his feet, and you are the last of them, replied Naruto before bringing in a table, chairs, paper, and plenty of ink to write on, followed by the Uzumaki's forces. LB start. Let's should we? SS shall we? Asked the fire daimyo nervously, attempting to be polite to the enemy. Yes. Let's get started. I have a schedule to keep, 
The Shogun replied before sitting down and watching Naruto remove his sword from the man's throat. Oh of course. Shogun-sama, what are your TT terms? As the man produced his terms of surrender for the feudal lord to read and sign, the fire daimyo inquired. Fire daimyo, everything is there for you to read and sign. The terms have laid out are more than fair, but they're also non-negotiable, and it would be foolish to protest, said the shogun as the fire daimyo read the conditions over and his eyes widened in surprise. The Shogun of Shadows Terms for the Surrender of Fire Country 1. The current capital of the Fire Country will become the Shogun's new capital, ruling over all the lands of the elemental countries, and the feudal lord will be allowed to live in exile with his family without persecution from the Shogun or his forces, provided the feudal lord does not provoke such a response. 2. The fire daimyo's bank accounts will be liquidated down to a fraction of their current value and used to help the poor people of this country, with enough remaining in the account to allow the feudal lord to relocate and live in exile with his family in a location of the shogun's choosing until told otherwise by the current shogun or one of his descendants. 3. All samurai and fire temple monks in fire country must pledge their loyalty to the shogun. Those who do not wish to serve him may leave fire country without retaliation to themselves or their families, provided they do not pose a threat to the shogun in the years that follow. 4. The fire daimyo must also hand over Konoha to the shogun, who will then order its immediate liquidation and destruction. And the fire daimyo must denounce the leaf village for its past crimes against the world, shinobi village, and their traitorous actions against whirlpool as the leaf was responsible for the country's fall by attacking it from within. 5. The fire daimyo will also denounce the Uchiha clan, with the exception of Uchiha Itachi, the Senju clan, with the exception of Senju Hashirama and Senju Tobarama, the Serutobi clan, the Abarame clan, the Inazuka clan, and every other clan in Konoha, with some members of the shogun's choosing being pardoned at his discretion. These terms you've established. They, they, they are ridiculous!" exclaimed the fire daimyo, and the shogun simply laughed. Come now, daimyo. I believe they are more than fair, given that I could easily kill you and the rest of your family before hanging all the heads for all to see. Do you desire that? At the very least, these terms allow you and your family to live in exile and relative peace without fear of a blade slicing your necks open one day. Do you mean I shouldn't be merciful? As the fire daimyo slumped his head in defeat, the shogun responded. No. Your conditions are both merciful and equitable. I. I concede to the terms and will sign, said the fire daimyo, his voice dejected, reaching for the signing brush near his right hand. Wait. I don't want you to sign with mere ink, the shogun declared before removing the signing brush from the table, and the fire daimyo discovered his left hand being held down by Han. Wait. What exactly are you doing? Inquired the fire daimyo before screamed in agony as the shogun stabbed the signing brush violently into it. That's much better. Sign this in your own blood now. Nothing seals a deal better than one's own life force binding them to a terms of surrender contract, said the shogun, handing the now blood-splattered signing brush to the fire daimyo with his right undamaged hand. Why you're insane? The fire daimyo exclaimed, the shogun's power erupting around him. I recommend you sign it fire daimyo. I'm sure you'd hate for me to dip the signing brush into your left hand again," replied the shogun, who saw the fire daimyo sign the terms of surrender with a slightly shaky right hand before affixing his official seal to make things official. The shogun was not required to sign because he had already signed it prior to the invasion of the fire country capital. Wait. That seal beside your name. Your. Exclaimed the fire daimyo in shock just before looking fearfully at the shogun. Itachi. If you please, the shogun replied, and the Uchiha immediately looked at the fire daimyo with his Sharingan eyes. Sukuyomi. 
Itachi yelled, and the fire daimyo's world went dark. Thank you, the shogun said, not wanting the man to reveal his true identity. Fire country is now yours, shogun-sama, Roshi said, with the shogun nodding and turning to face the red-haired man as Killer B carried away the unconscious fire daimyo. That is Roshi. Inform our forces that they need to rest. We will be moving against Konoha in a few days, and I want everyone to be fully rested when the time comes, replied the shogun, with Roshi nodding and departing to carry out the order. Word of this will spread quickly to Konoha before the day is out, Shogun-sama, Han predicted, and the Shogun laughed. I'm betting on it, Han. Make copies and send them to every shinobi village and daimyo in every country. Konoha is also included. I want everyone to know what happened here and how I won, explained the Shogun, knowing that once the world learned of his achievement, they would both fear and respect him when the time came to explain why. Konoha a little later. What? What do you mean by, missing? What happened to Hayuga Hanada, Mitarashi Anko, and Azuki Yugo? Demanded Tsunade, as the Junin in front of her struggled to respond. We looked everywhere for each of them. Residences homes, training grounds, where they go when they visit the village, and so on. They aren't in Konoha, replied the Junin, and he could see Tsunade about to burst. Go find them. Now. Demanded Tsunade, knowing that this wasn't going well. Tsunade had gotten a report that the local ramen shop was closed, cleaned out, and the two who ran it were long gone. No goodbye note. No explanation for leaving. Nothing. Tsunade knew deep down that Naruto was to blame because the ramen shop owner and his daughter Ayame had been good to Brat in the past. That three more Naruto fans had mysteriously vanished only reinforced that theory. Tsunade. You must see this. Jiraiya exclaimed as he appeared in the window and tossed her the scroll bearing the fire daimyo's seal. This. Can't be true. Tsunade's shocked words came as she undid the seal and read the contents. It was a copy, one of many, of the surrender agreement signed by the Fire Daimyo and the Shogun of Shadows. Tsunade read each condition word for word, and her heart nearly stopped at the mention of her clan, as well as Whirlpool's fall at the hands of its own ally. I checked with a few contacts I still have who owe me favors. I'm afraid it's true. Every influential person in every country received a copy of the original. Tsunade, the surrender of the Fire Daimyo to the Shogun of Shadows is entirely legal. No one can complain, protest, or argue against the Shogun's actions, no matter how much we wish they could, Jiraiya grimly responded. This is Naruto. That brat started the ball rolling to wipe us out. He took everyone close to him and now has no qualms about wiping us off the map. Tsunade exclaimed angrily, and Jiraiya nodded in agreement. That makes sense. He probably figured we'd use them against him in some way, like hostages or human shields, to make him back off, Jiraiya speculated, referring to how the councils and clan heads would most likely plan things against the Kyubi Jinshuriki. I'm not going to put up with this. We will fight until the bitter end. Tsunade yelled angrily at her teammate. That's great to hear Tsunade, but uh. They're already here, Jiraiya said, nervously pointing out the window at what he saw in the distance. The invasion force had arrived, and Konoha's final hours were approaching. So that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.